Welcome to a febrile infant. This is a first in the past test paediatrics for medical students set of videos. All of our videos start with a case presentation and here we have a three week old boy. He's presenting to the emergency department with an irritable cry. He's difficult to settle and he's got reduced feeding. The triage nurse has seen him and has taken some observations and here they are. So the heart rate's 175, respirates 35, temperature 38.5 centigrade and his saturations in 98% in air. Now paediatricians when they, they encounter fever which of course they do very frequently have to think of certain things and this is what they should be thinking of. So first of all common things and then things they mustn't miss. Now the common things that give you a fever, things like pharyngitis, uh, urinary tract infection, a lower respiratory tract infection, otitis media might do this or perhaps a systemic viremia but it's very important not to miss things things that are important and crucial to miss and missing them would be very very serious not only for your career but also for the child so things like septicemia, pyelonephritis, meningitis and perhaps what's going on is actually the child's decompensating in front of your eyes and has overwhelming septicemia Paediatrics is rather different to adult medicine. In fact, very few of the diagnoses that we spend much of our time with in paediatrics affect adults and vice versa. This slide tries to capture what's distinct about the paediatric approach to infection. Now, in children with infection, they don't always have a fever. In fact, many of their signs are unreliable. Neck stiffness doesn't always accompany meningitis. Chest signs don't always accompany pneumonia. The younger you are, the more likely chest signs and neck stiffness may not be there or even fever. Children with a urinary tract infection can be in, under serious problems from it because, it because it can ascend and cause kidney damage and it's difficult to make the diagnosis because the symptoms may not be there or be very very non-specific. Children also have poor immunity and so bacterial infection can quite often supervene and be very serious and the spectrum of bacteria particularly in the neonates are quite different to those later in life. Moving back to the case, what we've got in this situation is to think a little bit and these are some of the thoughts. So when you have a three week old, first of all you should wonder perhaps this is a congenital problem or perhaps this baby's presenting with some metabolic, inherited or enzyme defect. Perhaps this irritability is suggesting something's going on in the brain making it very unhappy, perhaps in pain. So perhaps a headache, perhaps pain somewhere else in the body is leading to this um, type of cry. On the other hand, if the cry is very weak, it suggests that actually the baby's not got much reserve left and may be decompensating. Poor feeding we see in most serious situations. In fact, it's kind of like the baby's level of activity when it can't tell us by any other means that it's not very well. So you'll often find that uh, a feeding history is particularly important to find out how serious the situation is. And more about that when we talk about assessment in a minute. Lastly, tachycardia and tachypnea we found that in the observations it could be just the fever leading to the tachycardia and the tachypnea but it could also be some sign of a cardiorespiratory collapse. Moving on to look at the assessment now I mentioned in the introduction that actually we typically look for diagnosis, screening and severity and it's important to separate out these in your mind when you're trying to work out what's going on with a child. Now obviously we're very very focused on getting a diagnosis and that's important to do that because then we might be able to treat it. When we come on to screening there are three areas that are particularly important development, immunization and safeguarding and when as a GP or an A&E you see a child with some other sort of problem it's always worth looking at these areas because you may pick up a child who's not developing properly or may pick up a chance to immunize a child and prevent a further problem or even pick up a child who's being abused or neglected. However, here we're much more interested in severity because this child may well be seriously ill. And I'll put on this slide here three ways that we can identify what the severity may be. And there's three different scales you can see here. Now on, the, uh, on this side you can see the AVPU scale which you'll probably be very familiar with. Of course a child like this is vocalizing, crying I suppose, yep that sounds good. So perhaps that's there. But it's also important to work out whether the child's well or compensated or decompensated and that tells you how quickly you need to act. Just on history you can often find out how bad they are and this is my playing to heart beating uh, severity scale. 
OK, getting back to the case. Now, we find that he's born at term, had a normal pregnancy. There's a two-year-old brother, but everyone else at home is well. This is a breastfed baby, and he's typically having a feed every two to three hours. But at the moment, it seems to be much less, and only having a little feed every four to six hours. No vomiting, no diarrhoea, no cough, and even his urine appears normal too. So not really very much to go on in terms of symptoms. He's also fixing on objects, but not smiling. So this is what would be normal at around three weeks of age. And also, because immunizations don't come until around two months of age, he hasn't had any of those yet. Now some of you may be thinking, well, two to three hours is really quite often to feed, but that's actually very normal for a breastfed baby, two to three hours, perhaps a bit, a bit longer overnight. Bottle-fed babies typically stretch things out a little bit more, three to four hours. The other thing that you can see on that is about vomiting. Now vomiting is a very non-specific symptom in children. And it's not, not really very much help pointing you to where it is. Anything can really lead to vomiting, perhaps meningitis, fever itself, GI problem. Even a cough can lead to vomiting. Moving on to examination, this is what we find. So he's quite alert but seems very unhappy. He's moving all of his limbs. There doesn't appear to be any neck stiffness. His anterior fontanelle, that's neither sunken nor bulging, so normal. We know already about the tachycardia, but we now find that there's, that there's no murmurs as well. The femoral arteries have been felt and they feel normal. Of course, that's how we screen for coarctation of the aorta. Looking at the chest, neither any added sounds nor any chest recession. Although, as we've mentioned already in this series, that doesn't mean there's no problem inside the lungs. The abdomen itself isn't distended and his liver is two centimetres below the costal margin. Now in children we find that the liver edge is often palpable throughout the first year and two centimetres is quite normal at this sort of age. There are no features of dehydration. So just looking at this a little bit more, that's about all you're going to get at this sort of age in terms of a neurological examination unless you want to go into great details. Next stiffness, as I've mentioned, isn't really a way to rule out meningitis and so we still have to think about that as a possible diagnosis. Coarctation is one of those things we screen for, but that's also part of the six-week check and the newborn check, and that will probably happen anyway. And again, chest recession, pneumonia, could still be a problem, even though there's no chest recession. If you remember from his initial observations, he was slightly tachypneic, and that might be the only sign we might see of pneumonia, and it will need a chest x-ray to pick it up. Lastly, looking at the fontanelle, when you feel the anterior fontanelle, what you're actually feeling is the size of the brain inside. And if it's sunken, that might imply that the brain itself is dehydrated. If the anterior fontanelle is bulging, this could be because of the brain edema or indeed hydrocephalus. We can now move on to the case synthesis. And this is my case synthesis for this child. A male neonate with fever and irritability but no localising signs. He appears to be compensated, and because he's compensated, we can focus on diagnosis and not on resuscitation. When he's young, as this child is, this increases the probability of serious bacterial infection or a congenital or metabolic problem. Putting things together in just a one-sentence thing is very important. It's very important in terms of communication with other medics and it helps you think about what's really going on in the case. So back to our initial thoughts, this was the slide we had from earlier. These were some of the things that we thought might be important. Now, we haven't really got a lot further than this. Really, everything on that slide is, slide is still a possibility. And so it looks like we'll have to do some kind of infection screen to try and pick up what's going on. So we'll plan to do a number of investigations. And this would be a typical set of investigations that we might do in a case like this. So a full blood count, urea electrolytes, a CRP to look for signs of inflammation. We might do liver function tests as well, blood culture, urine, chest x-ray and take some CSF via lumbar puncture. One thing that's quite distinctive about children is that we have to be quite careful about how we take our urine. Now in an adult, you can just simply give them a pot and they'll come back in a few minutes later with a midstream specimen. But you can't really do that in a three-weeker. So we have a number of ways to try and collect urine in a clean way. 
The most useful, perhaps, is what we call a clean catch urine, whereby the mother or the father simply waits for the child to pee with their nappy off and catches the urine as it comes out. So that's pretty much as good as a midstream specimen. But of course it does require quite a bit of waiting around. Another option might be to use a suprapubic uh, aspirate, which involves putting a needle in just above the symphysis pubis into the bladder. Quite painful, and uh, you really need to know you want a specimen. Another option is to pass a catheter up, take some urine, and move on. What you mustn't do is put a bag on and uh, ask the child to pee into that in time, because it almost always ends up contaminated. Now moving on to management options. These are really the four management options we have in really any case. We could be sending them home. Perhaps we need to keep a close eye on them and review them later and then decide what's going on. Perhaps we need some specific active treatment that's going to alter the course of their illness. Or do we need to do something symptomatic, make them feel better, perhaps a bit supportive? When we look at active treatment, there's really only four things that make a substantial difference to the underlying cause of the child's illness. Antibiotics, surgery steroids and chemotherapy and whenever we're in a situation where we don't know what to do we can always go back to this list and think are any of these going to be of any use for this child now in this child obviously we've got a child with a fever we're worried about infection we're not sure where the infection is coming from antibiotics sound a good plan but think again perhaps surgery might be important maybe there's an abscess somewhere perhaps it's an inflammatory condition and actually steroids would be quite useful and even some cancers can present with fever, and so perhaps chemotherapy may be an option. This is how we need to move forward, though, is think about these things as we're about to do our investigations, and they'll tell us about more about what's going on. So moving on to our investigations, this is the list we had a little bit earlier. Now we're going to look in a bit more detail about what each one of those is going to tell us. Now obviously if the white cell count's up, that does suggest an infection, but if the white cell count is particularly low, that suggests actually there's an overwhelming infection ongoing. The CRP is quite useful, but however we often find it's in the sort of 20-30 area which isn't really much used to tell us what sort of infection is there. Over 80 does suggest there's a bacterial infection ongoing. Liver function we test because actually herpes, herpes simplex infection that is, will often cause a hepatitis and it's a very important cause of neonatal fever and severe illness. So here's some results. So what, we, what have we got in here? We've got a full blood count and the uh, hemoglobin is 14.5, so that's fairly normal for three weeks of age. The white count is raised. Normal should be what a normal should be, i.e. under 10. Platelet count's normal. The rest of the user needs are fairly normal. The liver function's normal. The CRP is very raised at 156. And looking through the rest of the investigations, they appear to be normal until we get to the urine. And here we've got nitrates, leukocytes, and red blood cells there. And the nitrites in the urine suggest there's bacteria there that have been splitting the urea. So I think really from this we can pretty much work out that this child does have a severe urinary tract infection. And that's why the child's so irritable, that's what the fever's come from, it's pushed up the CRP and the white cell count. So here are some key facts relating to urinary tract infection in children. Now the first thing is of course it's quite common to, for a child to have a UTI. Two to five percent of children will get one at some point. And it's more common in uh, girls when they're older but equal in the sexes when they're tiny babies. The symptoms are usually non-specific especially when they're very young. So things like dysuria you won't really see until you get over five. In babies you might just get vomiting, diarrhea, bit of fever and that might be it. Those that are very young who have a UTI you should always wonder if they have an anatomical problem underlying it or perhaps something else like vesico-ureteric reflux. The bugs that they tend to get are usually gut organisms that ascend into the bladder and then sometimes go up to the kidney as well. One of the key distinctives though about UTIs in children is up to the age of seven they have the potential for long-term scarring. In boys, it could also be that they have actually have a particular anatomical problem, posterior urethral valves, which impair the flow of urine and lead to a UTI. When investigating children who have a UTI, 
We tend to do more tests in those who are under three months of age or have a particularly difficult to treat UTI. Most children will get a screen with an ultrasound and if this is positive they'll go on to have other tests as well to look for anatomical problems. The other key facts to remember about fever in children is the spectrum of microbes or bacteria that they're likely to get. Under a month of age the spectrum is very different to those over a month of age. And in the first month of life it's dominated by group B streptococcus, listeria and gram negatives. And these can give rise to septicemia, meningitis and chest infections. Over a month of age pneumococcus, meningococcus and to some extent Hib are particularly important. The urinary tract pathogens, as you can see from this slide, these are gut organisms, E. coli being easily the most common. My last slide relates to what you might see in an exam relating to fever in children. Pediatricians are very keen to get questions relating to fever into exams because it's such an important topic. So in an OSCE situation you might see things like history taking on a baby who's sick with non-specific symptoms. You might have uh, an explanation station where you have to explain to a simulated patient why supplementary tests are needed for a child who may just have a throat infection. And you may also see some video of a sick child who needs resuscitation and then work up for an infection. In the written part of an examination you may see lots of questions relating to diagnosis of different sorts of infections and particularly on UTI, because it's such a distinctive thing in paediatrics. You'll get uh, questions asking what tests would be appropriate, and then questions that ask you to interpret what the results mean. And then finally, making a management plan. I hope this has been a useful video for you, and good luck with the exam.